this morning. Look at all the kids headed down that way. Amen. Uh, turn your Bibles right now. I'm going to give you a chance to find in your passage of Scripture, Luke chapter number 16. Amen. Now, I, I want to use some words and make sure that they're gone. Okay, and, uh, well, just the hell with it. Amen. Let's, let's get the hell out of here. What kind of hell are we into today? Well, I, I believe that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, don't you? Well, well, well. Give them that rebel yell and give them hell. You know, I want to tell you something today that we superficially look at words and we don't understand the depth of what we say. Now, I want to preach to you a message this morning that most people do not believe. I want to preach to you a message today that they do not cognitively or recognize what they're saying, what they're living, or why they're even doing what they're doing. You see, we get so uh, used to or desensitized to a concept or a word that we lose its meaning and its power and we go on and live our life without the knowledge of what we should know. Do you know that the, uh, in America today, the number one curse word is hell? Everybody uses it. Amen? And, and it's a strong second to some other cuss words, but they're coming up out of lane two, and I hope we don't get there. Amen? The world today has been sold in Hollywood and in literature and in society about this concept of hell, but it has lost its teeth. It has lost its power. It has lost a degree or two as to the severity of hell. This morning, the, your the question was given to me, Pastor, do you really believe in hell? My question to you would be, do you really believe in hell? I believe today that we are going to look just for a moment at this construct, at this concept, but to me it is a concrete belief that I know immediately is true. Do you not know that Jesus Christ, when He spoke in the New Testament, your red-letter Bibles are just full of hell. Jesus spoke three times more of hell than He did heaven. Jesus warned every society, every town, every conference, every person, He warned them of hell. He was so adamant that they did not need to go there. Jesus spoke more about hell than He ever did heaven. But yet we listen less about this place that we call hell. I want to preach to you this morning when your life goes to hell. And I want to start in Luke chapter number 16 and verse number 19. Jesus has been speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees about some things that are eternal truths, but He uses a concept that we call parables. He tells stories that teach a truth. And he begins here in Luke chapter number 16 to speak to the scribes, the Pharisees, and those around him about hell and how it was going to be in that day that they got there. So I want to give you some simple things about when your life goes to hell. Read with me if you will. We'll start in verse number 19. Luke 16, 19. The Bible says this. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf that is fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass from us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father Abraham, Thou that wouldest, wouldest send unto him my father's house, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also should come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, the rich man, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, Abraham said unto the rich man, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I want to preach to you this morning when you make it to hell. Amen. Now, I, I want you to know that there's some things that are absolutely, that the Scripture brings out to us that you need to know. I want to be that clarion call. I want to be that sounding device. I want to be one of those that will stand in front of you and say that there's a fire in the building that you're trying to run to. I'm trying to tell you that just as sure as there is salvation, there is a place of eternal torment called hell. Just as good as there is that God uh, loves you and wants to give you great things, God has warned you and wants you out of that place that was made for the devil. I want you to know that. But if you choose to enter into hell, I want to guarantee you these simple things. Number one is that there will be a sudden separation. The Bible says this in verse number 22. Look at your passage of Scripture. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now I want to tell you that this rich man and Lazarus woke up that morning believing that that day was going to be like every other day. That there the rich man was dressed in all of his array. There he was uh, attended by servants. There he was in his great castle overlooking the city of Jerusalem. There he was living the high life. He said, this is going to be a great day because everything's going my way. And But yet he looked down and he saw that uh, there was those that had brought that old beggar crippled man. That old man that had sores all over his body. That man that had nothing as far as raiment. That man that could not even walk himself over to the gate. He had a bunch of friends, uh, if you call them that. But they drove by the rich man's and they pushed old Lazarus out. And there he was. And Lazarus spent that whole day hoping that a few crumbs from the rich man's table would roll down to where he could get them. That's the way they lived their lives. Now, the Scripture doesn't tell us how long. The Scripture doesn't say whether it was one week, one day, one year, one decade. I imagine it was a long time. I imagine that every day everybody got so used to looking up and seeing the rich man and they got used to looking down and seeing the poor man. And they decided that it's just going to be that way. And that's the way it's always going to be. Let me tell you this morning that you woke up this morning thinking today's going to be like yesterday. You think that if you've got it good, it's going good. If you, you think that everything's got uh, just your way and everybody's here to serve you and you live a sumptuous life and everything's going good, let me tell you, Amen. There's going to be a sudden separation. Look what it says in the verse 22. It came to pass. Don't you just love it when God says, hey, you may get used to where you're living, but it's going to come to pass. The Bible says, the soul that liveth that shall surely die. In Hebrews chapter number 9, it says that the soul uh, is appointed once and to die, and then after that is the judgment. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that there is a day, an hour, and a moment that God has got you written in to walk into your eternity. And I can't tell you that you're not going to make it through today. But you can't tell me that you're going to make it 
through the day. In my world, I, I've been a nurse for now 36 years. I've been a pastor for 35 years. I've seen those that looked healthy who have dropped over. Amen. I've seen those that I just knew were in the strength of their youth and they were everything going good for them. There was nothing they needed in this world and I'd get the call or I'd see them on the uh, stretcher. I want to tell you, what is life? It is very short. And the Bible says that there is going to be a sudden separation and it's going to happen like that. James chapter number 4, verse number 14 says it this way. James says, whereas you know not what you shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time. And that, that Greek phrase, little time, is a, half, a, a second. It's a second. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I want you to know that you are one breath away. One breath away from that sudden separation. Amen? That one breath away. And you that have lived your life in, in sumptuous living, you who have not uh, went to a Christ, you that have turned aside and you've sat down at your bountiful table and you've neglected the things of God and you've been just living your life your way and you always say this, well, maybe next week, next year, maybe tomorrow, I'll get serious about this thing that we call Christianity. Maybe I'll get serious about looking to Jesus Christ. Christ. Maybe I'll get serious about doing what I know to do. My friend, I want to tell you something. Tomorrow may not come. There was a king in Daniel's day. His name was Belshazzar. Belshazzar, it says in verse number 5 of Daniel, or verse 23 of Daniel 5, Thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. Thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, and wood. It's stone which sees not, nor hears, nor knows. And the God in whose thy hand is thy breath, thou hast not glorified. Man, I want to tell you this morning, I knew that I was going to have to preach this message. And I started looking. I do this as a pastor all the time. I start driving by and I start seeing people. Those, some are pulling boats, some are pulling campers, others on motorcycles, others out walking dogs, others just going about their life. And yet they're not looking to the things of God on this godly day. They are saying to themselves one of two things. Number one is they don't believe there is a hell. And number two, they don't behave as if there is a hell. If my house at 3174, right across over here, if my house was on fire, smoke filling it, and I see the blaze and I see the flames, it would be crazy of me to say, I'll just sit here and see how it's going to turn out. I'm just going to sit here and hopefully that fire is going to miss me. I'm just going to sit here and not call out to someone that can help me. I'm not going to dial 911. I'm not going to call for Sheila. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit here and keep eating my beanie weenies until the house burns down. Now, I want to tell you that there's people that way that just live their life as if they don't believe in hell and they behave as if there is no hell. And when they start burning in hell, it is because they have served themselves rather than God. Jesus said it this way in Luke 12, a few chapters back. There was a rich young man that had been prosperous. He had having trouble. He had such trouble like me and you. He had so much trouble that he had so much grain and so much wheat that he was having a storage problem. He said, what am I going to do? Uh, he, he never entered into his mind that he gives uh, 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 some of it to the church to use. He doesn't even enter in his mind that he needs to give it to those that are starving around him. But this man is so focused on himself that he says, what am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll just start building bigger barns. Bigger barns, that's the answer to my problem. Guys, I want to tell you that we live in a society today that are building bigger barns that are going to burn. 
You'd say, Pastor, I don't believe that. Man, I want to tell you something right now. You can't drive within two miles around this church without seeing at least 10 to 15 of them self-storage things. Amen? You know what self-storage is? It's junk that you don't want to get rid of. It's stuff that you think is valuable, and you're paying somebody else to watch your stuff because it's so valuable that you're focused on putting it in there. That's what this man was. Look what he says in Luke chapter number 12. And he spake a parable. Jesus said unto them, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. But God said unto him, How fool, this night thou soul shall be required of thee. I want to tell you today that there's going to be a sudden separation. You may be living high on the hog right now, but your hog is about to be ham, and that ham is going to get burnt. Amen? There's a sudden situation, separation in your life. And this morning, I want to say to you that if you're this rich man, you ain't there yet, but you're headed that way. Amen? Now, number one is that when your life goes to hell, there's going to be that sudden uh, separation. Number two is that it turns into a very serious situation. Look in verse 23 of the Scripture. In your verse, in your passage of Scripture, look in verse 23. And the Bible says, And in hell he lift up his eyes. Now I want to stop right there. If you've got a King James, and I hope you do, and the Bible says in verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes. It is not a past tense. It is a present tense. It means he is actively doing this. He lift up his eyes. That means that it didn't make it for a day or a week or a year. I believe that every time a preacher, a pastor preaches on this, that rich man hears the sermon and the only words that can come out of his mouth is amen and oh my. I believe that this man is in a serious situation. He went from the penthouse to the poorhouse. He went from being somebody to burning forever and ever. I don't believe that, that, as they say, the purgatory, where you just kind of snuff out. I don't believe, like some would say uh, in LNG Whiteism, that would say, oh no, it doesn't even exist. Amen? I don't believe that. I believe that if Jesus said it this way, I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe that the words of God are pure. I believe that the words of God are tried seven times. I believe that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit of God, put it exactly this way so that it would show you that there's a serious situation. And in hell He lived. He's doing it right now. Being in torments. Now look at the Scripture, verse 23 again. It doesn't say one, it's plural. It's a plural word. He is in torments. What are the torments? Well, there are three that you need to understand. Number one is physical. I believe that the flesh is burning and boiling, but it can't be taken away. I believe that but the second that you, that sudden event happens in your life and you are in hell, I believe that you are in a serious situation because it never ends. The Bible says where the worm is not quenched and the fire is not put out. I believe that those who have died a hundred years ago have burned for a hundred years and they've got another uh, infinite time. I don't believe that you just go away or you burn up or somebody can pray you out. I believe today that this serious situation needs to be called for what it is. You need to understand there is no backing up. There is no back door. There is no buying your way out. When you hit the door of hell, you're going to be home for eternity. Serious situation. These torments are physical. I believe that your body burns forever. They are mental. He saw what he had. He saw what he didn't have. What he had was splendor on this earth, but hell in eternity. Now he looks across and he sees the beggar. 
The beggar is now in the paradise. He is now with Abraham. He is now in the presence of all the saints. He is the one that is being ministered to. Lazarus is being ministered by angels. And he's in the presence of God. And he is there living a life of eternity that is splendorous where this guy's situation is very seriously wrong. When your life goes to hell, I want you to know that physically you're going to burn forever. Amen. I believe that your mind is going to be as clear as it's ever been. I believe that you will see everything. You will see all the chances, all the opportunities, all the goodness and grace of God that God gave to you to bring you to His Son, to show you how much He loves you, to set forth for you a door of escape. I believe you'll see every person that come and talk to you, that every person that said, I want to invite you to church, every person that says, you need Jesus, every person that just spoke to you out of the Word of God, I believe for the rest of eternity you will hear that on a constant loop. I believe you will hear it forever and ever and ever. It's a serious situation. It is so bad that it is there. I believe that the Word of God is very clear that it gives us the present tense and a plural tense of our physical and our mental, but it gets worse. As bad as those two are, the worst is that your soul suffers. And I'm going to slow it down and I'm going to paint you a picture. But you're going to be able to see out of hell. You're going to be able to see the splendor of that beautiful city. You are going to be able to see the faces and hear the voices as they sing that chorus of redeemed and redeemed. I believe that you're going to be able to see the twelve manner of fruit, the river of life, the crystal sea. I believe that you're going to see those twelve gates. I believe all those things that you're going to be able to look up and see them. And your soul is going to be tormented for eternity. So it is a sudden thing. It is a serious situation. But I want to tell you, it's a sovereign selection. God doesn't make mistakes. And you don't get by and get a pass. You have selected where you go. You have chosen where you go. Look in verse number 26. It's sudden, it's serious, and now it's sovereign. Look in verse 26. The Bible says this. It says in verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. What does that mean? It means that there is a distance that you cannot bridge. You can't make it. God has put up. You remember in the book of Genesis that God put the angels in front of the Garden of Eden. Those same angels in in the eternity are going to guard the entrance to hell to where no one will leave. They will not allow passage with those that are there. He says in verse number 26 that it is a sovereign thing. And notice that God gets it right. God knows who's His and who's not. When they both died, back in verses uh, 20, if God was confused, He might have got it wrong. He might have chose one and forgot the other. He might have got them mixed up. They both look a little bit alike. They're both Jews. No. Your choice turns sovereign in that what you select. Now, people tell me all the time, I, I can't understand the concept of a loving God who puts people in a burning hell. I stop them right there. God said this, that He is long-suffering towards us, humanity. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the glory of life. I believe the Bible says what it says. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, that whosoever, He puts it out there, whosoever, rich, poor, black, white, educated, whosoever, 
For whosoever believeth in Him, Jesus, they shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But if you go one more verse down, verse 17 says, but he is condemned who rejects the Son. You go to hell, and you're going as a, a stranger, but you're going. Why? Because you've rejected the door. You've rejected the escape. You've rejected Jesus Christ. You have said that you can handle it, and in hell you will handle it. It is a sovereign selection by God that those who choose the Son shall be saved. Those who reject the Son shall be sentenced by a sovereign God. I want you to know it's going to be sorrowful. Man, I, I, I can't... This country preacher can't paint you a picture dark enough. I can't give you the drama dark enough as to what's going on here in verse number 27. The rich man says to Abraham, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father Abraham, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. Verse 28, For I have five brethren that may testify unto them. Send Lazarus. If they saw Lazarus back from the dead, then they'd believe. I want to tell you real clearly here about the scenario that you don't want to think about. You are going to be responsible for sending somebody to hell. You. Because you did not accept, you've damned the branch. I've seen families who have said to themselves, fathers who have said there's no such thing, there's nothing that, and they take their children into the world, and their work, and the children live ungodly lives, and you just perpetuate generation after generation after generation. My friend, I want to tell you, do you want to be the one that sends your child to hell? Church members, you want to be the one that doesn't say it? To someone headed to hell? Well, Pastor, I might offend them. Yeah, the gospel is very offensive. But my friend, I want to tell you, there's nobody going to run by me headed into a burning building unless I say, building's on fire. You don't need to go in there. We need to understand that this scenario plays itself out time and time and time again. Oh, Father Abraham, send someone from the dead. Send Lazarus back. Send some great moniker or some great miracle. Jesus said, listen, the scenario is this. It's sorrowful because you have turned away from the Word of God. Look what it said. In verse 27, it says that they have the prophets and Moses. What is that? It's the first five Bibles or first five books of the Old Testament. And then the prophets are the less of the Old Testament. They have the Word of God. The Word of God is the warning of God. And the will of God is that no one would enter into this terrible place, but the scenario is played out day after day after day of people who are stepping into hell and taking people with them. I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm going to tell you. There is 153,000 people. Now, this is a round number, but I looked it up this morning to make sure it was right. 153,000 people every day that dies in the world. Over 56 million a year. And the Bible says this, that broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And when it says broad is the way, it gives a Jewish perspective or a percentage. We know it to be at least 50%, but scholars know and understand that it says 75% of humanity is walking into hell. That means three out of four. Everybody that you pass tomorrow, whether it's at work or at school and your family, whatever, four people walk by you scripturally wise 
Three out of four. It is a sorrowful scenario. I'm going to give you one stern statement, and then this thing's going to be over with. I want you to look, if you will, in verse number 29. This, the strongest stern statement that I can make to you today. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them hear the word of God. People don't want to hear the word of God because it convicts them. It causes them to realize that God is in heaven and they risk hell. You need to understand. Abraham saith they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Will you hear this morning? I want to ask you a question very clearly. Will you hear Moses and the prophets? Will you be that one that understands that you're that close to stepping into this rich man's life? I, I don't know your heart. I don't want to know your heart. But I do want to say this. The Bible is very clear. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of people talking it. But very few are walking it. Jesus said this, My disciples shall hear my voice and do my will. I don't care if it was 30 years ago and you filled out some little card. You checked a few boxes. You joined a church. You got into a denomination. And all of a sudden you think you're okay to go out and live any way you want to live. My friend, I want to tell you this. The Bible says very clearly, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, things of the flesh... He shall reap to life everlasting or to damnation everlasting. But I want you to know God knows and you know. It did not surprise this rich man when he looked up and saw that he was in hell. It's not going to surprise you because the Bible says very clearly that those that are His and who are called according to His purpose will listen to His voice and walk the pathway of righteousness. I don't care what the TV preachers say. I don't care what they say in any other place. The Word of God says this, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Got just another second. I might as well just get there. It's not part of what I was going to say, but I want to say it. The Lord brought it to my memory. I want you to turn your Bibles. If you've got one, turn it to Revelation. The last thing, Revelation chapter number 20. Where the rubber meets the road. The Bible says this, Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 12. And I saw the dead, those who did not have the Son. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead, those that are in hell, will be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And I want to tell you, if you're here listening, either in the congregation or by way of Facebook, you still got a chance. You haven't stepped off into eternity yet. But I want you to understand. But when your life goes to hell, it's going to suddenly separate you from all the things that you think that you've got. It's going to suddenly happen right like that. Well, there's people laying up in ICUs all throughout this land who thinks that they're going to get better. That they think that there's a pill, a plan, a procedure, a, a physician. Somebody's going to get them out of there. My friend, I want to tell you something. We're all going to die. I want you to know that it's a serious situation. You may be one who doesn't believe in hell. You may be, have a behavior that you don't even believe in hell. 
But I want you to understand something today. As sure as I know that Jesus Christ is God of gods, Lord of lords, and King of kings, Jesus said that there is this place that you don't need to go to. And He's going to get it right in that day. Those that are going to hell is because they have selected to go to hell. You have selected to go to hell. You have walked past the blood. You have walked past the Bible. You have walked past the testimony of Christians. And you are going to step into hell of your own accord. You are going to be one that is going to be so sorrowful that you, if you could, wish that you would come back and tell your spouse, your children, your friends, you'd tell the whole world. If we could just get you back for five minutes, you'd be the biggest evangelist that there's ever been. But by then, it will be too late. I want to say it real sternly. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, you're one breath, one beat away from hell. And God has given you this opportunity to come forward and to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you accept Him as your Savior, you're not going to be your own anymore. The Bible says, Behold, all things are new. We're new creatures in Christ. Instead of looking what's best for you, you will look what is glorifying to God. Instead of holding it and hoarding it for yourself, you will say, God, you've blessed me with this. Let me give to those who have less. You will find a way to witness. You will find a way to walk in the rightness and the righteousness of Christ. You will be an image of God in that you will be a testimony. But you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. Every head bowed, Marissa, as you come. Father, we come to you this morning, and Father, it's you.